everybody, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Rahat. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. So, so folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Uh, my name is Rahat Yasser. Um, where am I? Uh, I'm in uh, Montreal, Canada. Montreal. And uh, what do I do? So I'm a Microsoft MVP in uh, AI category. It's been like eight years that I'm an MVP uh first three years was in a windows dev a platform hmm. and later last five years uh in a, uh ai category and there are like maybe two ai mvps in canada and around 120 something in in the world so i'm one of them now, now did you kind of switch like what you focused on or did the category kind of evolve and change evolved. underneath you okay yeah so because uh, my expertise is uh, data science and ai so at that time, when I was uh, like, when I became like the MVP in Windows Dev, I was focusing on uh, application that are using AI and data science. Mm -hmm. So they put me into the uh, like uh, Windows Dev category for that. But whenever the AI started five six years ago, that is the time like uh, they hooked me on that one and moved me. Yeah. Well, I know with with so much of Microsoft, and I've talked about this in other episodes with other MVPs about how you know there was a shift with within Microsoft and the product teams a few years back where they 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 kind of went through a wave where they laid off a lot of SDETs, a lot of the testing folks, and they, but at the same time were hiring uh, data analysts and yeah. to, to come in. So data driven product management decisions, like what are we actually seeing? What are people actually using? What's the feedback on products? releasing something look at the data look at anal you know, the analysis there sometimes rolling back features or or here's why we made the decision on moving this button on this screen or or what what have you yeah so in, should... a, in a traditional world yeah what happened what used to happen is product managers pro pos or executives they used to take the decision uh yes they were visionaries uh they were setting up the vision they had used to have some uh market research but mm -hmm. again like it was coming from them it's kind of like centralized decision making but then what happened they got to know about like okay we can collect all those data we can capture everything we can find out pattern we can actually know how clients and customers are evolving and communicating which uh, features uh, they are interested about, which features they're not using at all. So then they started to use them and uh, started to like design products based on the data, data-driven product designing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, one thing is, uh, so I have uh, two of my adult children that are both in the, there's both STEM sciences kids and um, both of them have uh, gotten a passion for uh, for data analysis. And both of them started playing with Power BI and other stuff. Of course, nice. one of them nerds out. He's like, I love Python. I'm like, you love Python? Come on. <laughs> you know, uh, but it, it's, but it's interesting how, you know, data science is really touched every industry, uh, multiple roles within that. So it's a skill set. I was pushing my, one of my sons, like, Hey, you're going to go pursue this. This is, he's actually a, um, uh, we call him a weather boy. Uh, he's about to graduate in atmospheric sciences, his degree. Okay. And, and I, I tried to convince him like do a minor in data science, like go, go find something. And he actually said to me, he's just like, ah, no, no, I'm okay. You know? And uh, he, he's just like, dad, that's one of my regrets is that I should have done the minor. I should have focused more on that. So, but he can always learn. And of like, course, uh, of course. Yeah. So the way I see it, like, uh, like last few years, still a lot of people in the, within the industry were, were thinking like, oh, data science is a fancy thing. AI is a fancy thing, just a buzzword or hype or something like that. But no, if you look at like, um, again, like we are not going to get into the argument of like statistics, machine learning, uh, all those kind of things. It's, it's end of the day, it's just the same, finding the pattern with the no, data. Let's get into the and argument I, of the, the data science versus <laughs> machine learning. And let's, I, I want to no, understand. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no I know. <laughs> but uh, the way I see it, it's kind of like in future, uh, because of the democratization of the AI and data science, it will be so easy so that anyone will be able to use it. So how? If you look at the uh, schools, so they're like the teachers after the exam, they find out, oh, top 10% of the score is this, top 20, like less than 20% is this, mm -hmm. bottom 20% is this. So they're using very basic stats. 
You can you do the same thing along with the behavior of students, their learning pattern to find out which student needs more attention. Uh, how can they do those personalized training and learning pattern? So that is kind of like getting uh, like a kind of like aligned with the, the overall learning pattern coming up with different types of like uh, adaptive learning uh, like uh, strategies so that the learning is designed for each and individual. So it's not going to be just generic. And now, are, are, now, what you're working on, aren't we just uh, increasing the speed at which we achieve the future, the idiocracy? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. You've seen that so, classic film. It's an important film. It's almost like yeah, it's a it future is. historical document, you know. It is, but uh, there are good and bad side in both cases, yeah, you know. Of course. <laughs> Think of all the soda pop we get to consume in the future. I mean, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. But uh, from the work wise, uh, so if I just like I give a quick intro, uh, it's been like uh, quite a few years. I'm in this data science and AI domain, and currently I'm working at uh, Isaac, Isaac Instruments. Mm -hmm. It's a company based in North America, head offices in uh, St. Bruno, Montreal. So we are in like, uh, we have offices in Toronto, uh, Calgary, Ohio, in US, and we design AI solution, uh, like hardware and software solution for truck fleet. So this is very interesting, uh, the way uh, things Isaac does. So they're one of the biggest in uh, Canada right now. So what they do is all those like big trucks that we see, they install an IoT device, a black box, they call mm -hmm. it in metric on that one that has tons of like sensors. Those sensors are collecting data uh, every seconds, every milliseconds uh, on that level. And then they have different types of like uh, tablet app, mobile app, web application, desktop application to help the truck fleets for their management, how the order is happening, where are those trucks, if there is any issues or not. Mm -hmm. Then we started the data science and AI. So then we saw that we are literally receiving 40,000 rows of data, like 40,000 records every second from every single corners of uh, North America. And those data has like GPS information, uh, truck information, how the supply chain is moving. And then we started to do uh, design like a full cloud platform in the, in Azure. They all, they were already in the cloud, but we started to like make it more robust, scalable, uh, made it like more uh, like better for the data science and AI related consumption. Then uh, we are doing a uh, big data analysis. So in a day we receive literally like billions of records uh, like mm -hmm. of data. Now we are kind of like finding the gist of that data, summarization, aggregation, what is actually happening so that we can apply those uh, summarization of the data uh, in business uh, like uh, automation, different types of like efficiency and also find out which truck is having issue, which driver is having is struggling to drive in different types of like mm -hmm. road condition. Then the next phase we are getting into is AI. So we also hired a bunch of like data scientists uh, and AI engineers to start to like design AI models, which a truck is going to have issues, similar kind of things, behavior, driver behavior analysis, uh, adding different types of correlation. So that's what I do uh, with my team, uh, designing all those like cool data science and AI applications, and they will hit the market soon, uh, like uh, because we already did a lot of like groundwork so that our clients can enjoy the products. That's very cool. Uh, now, are you working in, with specific industries or certain areas, or is it you have customers it's across open. the board? <laughs> across the board, actually, because... Uh, Thinking like that, like if you are in like a big truck fleet company or like a big Walmart Canada, you have hundreds of trucks yeah. or any other like big truck fleet uh, organization, uh, you are bringing, getting all those things in different ports uh, because the shipments is coming to big ships. And then yeah. from those ports, you are literally like uh, uh, loading everything on that truck and delivering it into different places of uh, within the city or the, in the country. One interesting thing, like, uh, I'm, as I'm not from the trucking industry, the first learning from me was we are literally everyone is very connected with this trucking industry. We we don't even realize because suppose in Montreal, the salad uh, that we eat, it comes from San Francisco. So hmm. a couple of drivers uh, take a big truck every bar, uh, like almost every day drive from Montreal to San Francisco, California, get everything, all those like a salad and everything, and then drive it back. And that truck has obviously fridge and everything. And for uh, people that don't know too, that's like a four day drive. Yes. You know, so yes. yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so 
it's it's very connected and that's what we are trying to do is make that supply chain operation easier and more efficient save yeah. money save co2 uh, mm-hmm. co2 emission is also like extremely important uh, green energy is important saving the fuel is also important so that is our responsibility with data science and ai to solve you know it's it's fascinating to me like so I, early in my career about the first uh, you know 12 13 years i worked uh, almost exclusively in uh, it, it, so I was in telecom for a number of years and went to work for an early SaaS company in 2001, but I owned these massive databases, all this, like I've done, you know, GIS data. So, you know, geolocation data that we've integrated into the platform and at the phone company, here's an example of, uh, you know, it makes a big difference when trucks show up to dig up a street to, to ch- fix wires that yeah. the accuracy of the map is within like three meters versus 30 meters. That's a lot of street that you might dig up before you find what you need to fix. And so we were constantly updating that. What's interesting though, with a lot of the, uh, you know, with the IOT and and you see a lot of the developments around it is that the system's actually able to go in and based on, you know, it's able to predict more accurately where there are errors within the system and things to go and look yeah. for and then where to go and you know focus and proactively look at and say hey here's the different uh, uh you know situations weather patterns or changes that most likely cause like a risk assessment on hey yeah. if we make these changes there's this activity around these devices they are more likely to fail and so you can have, make sure that I've got the parts and the systems and the people ready on hand in case we experience those failures. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, there's so, like, like I was saying, I mean, there's so many opportunities for AI and what you go and, and automate to, to, to go and have a, you know, a better real time picture of what's happening, whether you're like, I have, I went from telecom into you know, really kind of the, the high-tech manufacturing space and sort of learned about that. And we were building, again, massive databases to better understand like demand planning. Like we're going to build a product. Yeah. If we change yeah. a design, what's impacted that? So that we could guess if I make this design change, here's how it's going to affect when trucks can be on the road to stores with those modified devices. Like we'd know everything yeah. around that activity and it's it, and automating that so that the system is doing more thinking about it just speeds up that process. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fascinating. No, it's, it is fascinating. And the way the overall global AI market is growing, it's scary actually in some cases, mm. because I was just uh, for one of the report, like I was just like looking at uh, some of the blogs and articles uh, to put it in a presentation, how big the AI market is right now from all those like Bloomberg uh, Forbes, uh, like mm-hmm. uh, uh, prediction. So I was looking at the number like today, the global AI market is almost uh, $60 billion. Uh, but by 2028, it's going to be $422 billion. So year over year growth is 39.4. And that is massive. And yeah. one of the interesting part is 43% of this overall revenue or the growth will happen in North America, US and Canada. Mm-hmm. So there is a big chunk. And it's also like a big responsibility for us to bring those innovation so that uh, we can bring that kind of like automation as well. Yeah, there's a, it's a great space to get into. I mean, so you've been doing this long enough. Like, uh, what is your recommendation? People that want to, you know, get into this, like, where should they get started? What should they start experimenting with to learn more about the space? So there are like two types of, uh, two ways to get into data science and AI. First one, I see if you are already uh, in one of the industries, like any kind, uh, like uh, teaching, uh, like uh, pharmaceutical, uh, biochemist, or uh, like any any other physics. So you have the opportunity, or even like insurance, uh, suppose actuarial science, you have already the domain knowledge. Now, the next thing that uh, you can do is learn coding, Python coding, uh, what kind of like data science, uh, like a model that, how can you design those data science model? What kind of models are there, like classification, regression, time series based mm-hmm. models, be- very basic. So your domain knowledge is really useful and valuable and add this, that extra skill of Python coding, some uh, like basic life cycle of AI model development and design those kind of like data analytics products and AI products for your industry. That's one of the use case. And the second, in the, the second use case I see, if you are someone from computer science and already knows coding, 
that is perfect. Go and learn Azure, Azure Machine Learning, how to train the model. What does it mean by a model? So how do you monitor that model? How do you deploy that kind of like AI model? What is the use case? So we, so that you can help different kind of like domain experts and different industries and take and design the model with uh, that much big data and then deploy those model in for different types of business purpose. Yeah, it's, it, it, I know that there's also um, just tons of training. There's free training, there are certificate programs, the things out there. There's a lot of ways to go. And for, for beginners, you can have absolutely no coding background and not be in a, a tech you know, field at all and still be able to go in and learn about those things. I like, so as a guy who has two marketing degrees, of course, I've been in tech my entire career, but, uh, you know, so I understand a, a lot of things, but like I, you know, back in the day I did, like, yeah. I knew a bunch of Unix. Well, that really lasted long, uh, you know, but uh, you've know, never been a coder, I've never been an engineer, uh, but to get into it, but uh, I found a couple of programs like via, you know, through LinkedIn learning and through some other resources, uh, was able to go and take some, do some basic things and could have gone and pursued that. So there's a lot of opportunities to, to learn about that. For somebody yes. who's already in the space, that, that's like, what, what was kind of your path to becoming an MVP? I know you've been in the, this space for a while, you know, because I, so, I think this is a growing area, even for MVPs. I yeah. think there's plenty of room for new AI. A, a lot, yeah. So the my journey was a bit different because... Um, 10, 12 years ago, uh, I got invited to attend uh, Microsoft Student Partner Summit, uh, MSP Summit uh, in Seattle. So I went there, uh, I was loving Windows Phone. And at that time I also like uh, participated at uh, Microsoft Imagine Cup, uh, like, uh, and then, which was in Windows Phone uh, application, Windows Phone platform. So which kind of like eventually took me into a situation where, oh, I want to do this, I want to design that, but there is not enough documentation, tutorials or something like that. Mm -hmm. I started to write tutorial by myself. I, I was fixing this issue and then I was writing a blog or tutorial or a video uh, like that time, which, uh, and I was publishing them on C-Sharp Corner. So like a technical mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. And later I saw that it got like maybe a million plus views and it, everything was uh, like, I, I launched everything for free. Someone gave me an idea like, hey, why don't you publish a book? Then I wrote a book on Windows Phone 8.1 application development. That was the first wow. book on that platform, which eventually transferred into universal Windows platform application development. That was also like one of the first books uh, that I yep. wrote and then launched it for free. So whoever wants to download it, just download it and use it and be, uh, develop a, a Windows Phone application. I was I was in love that much uh, on that pla with that platform. I have to say, I, I then... missed the Windows Phone. I was a fan of it as well. <laughs> oh, um, a lot. Yeah, I miss a lot. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, for those that never use a Windows Phone. I mean, those. Uh, I mean, it was a. It's just a great UI. Uh, it really was, and I'm I'm really sad. And I was on, uh, you know, still on Verizon platform. So we, oh, like, we didn't even get the updates. You know, the AT and T people in the US, you know, got another update of newer phones like before we did, but yeah, I, I missed that platform. <laughs> yeah, eventually Microsoft contacted me. Hey, you have published this book, that book. So we are giving you, rewarding you with the MVP award. And that kind of like started the journey. And eventually as my domain is data science and AI more into that, uh, I work in uh, research scientists and a lot of other AI places regarding uh, AI projects then they rewarded me, changed my uh, like uh, overall AI MVP category into AI. So it's a very interesting journey. And uh, yeah. I still like uh, write blogs. Uh, I still like a gift. I, I give a lot of talks actually. That's what I like enjoy the most. Kind of like um, sometimes I talk to business audience. Sometimes I talk to uh, like IT audience or like completely technical. Sometimes I talk to a mix of both so that I can show that how to design a complete data science and AI platform Mm -hmm. where without having 10 different tools within the ecosystem or juggling around from a single place in Azure, you can do everything uh, like store your data, build your operational databases, uh, build, build your analytical uh, data side, then uh, do the data science training because your AI platform and the data platform needs to be close. If it is too far, then it's, it becomes very expensive because you need to move the data for different types of training, uh, like ap approaches, uh, ethics uh, and responsible and like security, those things will be hard to ensure as well because you need to like data movement, 
uh, data balancing, those are hard. So that's what I do sometime. Uh, and sometime I even like, uh, like give presentation on new topics uh, about how IoT, we can design AI on large volume IoT uh, like uh, applications or even like uh, design AI with no code, low code with the power platform, Azure AI mix of both. So it's, it's fun and uh, every year I try to keep like 10 to 15 talks. Uh, sometime I travel, it's also the fun part in different corners. Maybe next uh, trip will be in Toronto in uh, October. Then November, uh, I will be in like California, San Francisco for mm -hmm. AI dev, give uh, kind of like a, maybe one of the keynote kind of uh, like a talk. So that will be fun as well. So it's, it's a fun ride, yeah. Yeah, there's always a lot going on. And of course, uh, anybody that, um... Uh, you know, I'm sure you do the same thing, but it's like uh, uh, there's enough user groups and and other just purely virtual events that are always looking for speakers. And uh, I wish more would, uh, or well, uh, I would say reach out through like the mvp.microsoft.com site to look for speakers. I would say that, but it's not exactly easy to navigate and find people that are, we, we almost need to have as part of that tool is kind of a yeah. speakers bureau for MVPs. Like, Hey, Microsoft, if you're watching, uh, let, let, what about a speakers bureau? That would be fantastic to have there. So people could go and find us based on the region, or based on our interest in various topics and our, our specialties. I think it would be yeah. fantastic. But anyway, we can we can dream, you know. Yeah, but also like uh, it is kind of like we do it on a voluntary basis. So mm -hmm. we have our own uh, day job, family and life and everything. But it's still like... Uh, uh, all those MVPs that I see in uh, US, Canada, Europe, everywhere, they're so passionate. They're trying to like uh, help everyone or come up with like a new ideas, sharing new ideas. This community is amazing. I, I always learn so much uh, from everyone. Yeah. Well, with all this stuff going on, maybe this is a great, I don't think I've asked anybody this, but so how do you battle with all of that and the community activities and your job, your family, the rest of the things that you try to do, you know, how do you stay, keep from getting burned out? For me, it's easy because uh, things I do in the day job, uh, I just, I can just like talk about those topics at the conference as well. So I don't need to like take too much of a presentation or preparation to create the material or something like that. So it's, it's pretty easy, but it's also true. Like uh, there is a, like a risk of like uh, getting burned out. That's life, nothing to do, you know, <laughs> we all are juggling with that. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's always great when you're able to, your passions for the technology, the topics. I mean, similarly, I'm able to yeah. talk about things, the things that I do from a community standpoint are supported by my company. I'm talking about things that are relevant to my job, to my company. And so there, I've, I've found that mix. That wasn't always the case. I mean, I've worked other jobs where the things that I did with community were completely evenings and weekends and, yeah. you know, and, and had to even fight for that time. Um, but it's, uh, you know, Hey, we, we do it again. You do what you're passionate for. And sometimes you need to be realistic about what you can do and what your family can support and, and kind of ease off on it. But that's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, talking with like people about trying to get them to be guests on a podcast or speakers at an event. And they're just like, yeah, yeah I've just got too much. And I'm just like, Hey, no problem. Let's talk again in six months. Yeah. You know, don't worry about it. You don't need to make excuses for that. So it's it's important yeah. that we uh, we we not pile too much uh, on each other. If uh, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> anyway. And even like uh, from the uh, like MVP and contribution level, I I have noticed like our CPMs, community program managers of uh -huh. uh, MVP program, they're also very supportive. So if any year I felt oh I didn't contribute enough, I I should have like contributed more. I have communicated and like told them like, hey, I'm busy with my work or family, these new things are happening. They're like, okay, uh, we, like they review uh, your contribution of last over four, five, six years. It's as it's already eight years for me. And they're always trying to like uh, come up with like different types of suggestion, advice. Oh, uh, put your more effort in this one so that like you feel more uh, like uh, less pressure and like more uh, like uh, uh, involved uh, with the community. So that always helps. Yep. That's, that's a great tip too, for anybody that's uh, new MVPs, especially is, is have a good relationship with the CPM so that you know, have a conversation for exactly those reasons, because Hey, life happens. Everybody understands that. I, I think the one positive that came out of the pandemic is that I think that we, people in general 
my my observation is that people are more empathetic to others and and some of those things like you remember like if you've ever been on a call and the dog starts it's like oh i'm so sorry or i'm a few minutes <sighs> yeah. late and i remember being chewed out by a by a vp um uh, somebody who was on a, a webinar dialed in i was supposed to do a demo and walk through and there's construction happening they cut through yeah. the fiber i lost my internet was out and so i dialed in tried to call people by the phone saying like my internet's gone this guy like chewed me out was so angry went to my boss to complain about that and i'm like wow what a jerk Come on. Well, it's like it's like Just you know be a bit more kind. like yeah. i'm sorry you know <laughs> but uh, yeah i think people are a lot more empathetic to those kinds of things and and work-life balance as well so yeah well, that's great well rahat so people want to find out more about you or get in touch with you what are the best ways to reach you oh linkedin uh, you can just like search my name, Rahat Yasser. Uh, you can find me and uh, follow me. Uh, these days I've started to like uh, share more uh, about like Azure AI, different types of opportunities with the community. So every Friday I'm trying to like post a bunch of like things, kind of like learning materials so that people can go and find it and like learn something. Suppose uh, last Friday, I, I, I saw that uh, Gartner published that Microsoft uh, is uh, the leader and also like the most visionary in this cloud AI space. So mm -hmm. that also like I created like a nice overview use case. If you want to learn this uh, visionary and like leader uh, tool base, so what you need to do. So these are the like all those like links and things that you can go and like learn and like excel in your career. So that kind. So. Yeah. The week before, I also like uh, presented something regarding um, uh, like Azure MLOps because MLOps is something that everyone is also like struggling about in the market. Mm -hmm. So how to build those things and how to design it? That's that's one thing I uh, prepared. That's very cool. You know, there I know a couple MVPs too that have uh, built out uh, uh, their blogs, their websites uh, as resources, training within specific categories found yeah. all the all the guides put all the resources just made it kind of a hub for everything around that that's a that's a great utility it's a good thing if you're looking to kind of differentiate yourself and and maybe yeah. pursue becoming an mvp is to become yeah. that hub that go-to for a category of, of technology so yeah see like you don't need to like write the same article that is already written by someone else just promote it give them the actual right. credit and uh, always give them, them like, credit yes yeah, yeah, yeah for sure that's more important yeah. than anything <laughs> yeah well rahat really great to meet you and uh and hope to see you in person at an event sometime soon but you know thanks so much for participating today thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs>